Hi everyone, let's talk about what to eat for a healthy heart. My name is Samantha and I'm a dietitian in the cardiac rehab program. So let's get started. So today what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about fats, we're going to talk about fiber, we're going to talk about Canada's new food guide. We're also going to talk about the Mediterranean diet, um, tips for healthy eating to make it really practical. We're going to talk about salt and sodium and what's involved with that. And finally, we'll finish off talking about the recommendations for alcohol. All right, so st let's start off talking about fat. So the important thing we need to know about fat is that everybody needs to eat fat, right? Fat is an important part of our body's requirements. It's an energy source. It allows food to taste really good and it allows our body to function properly. So that's why we need fat in our diet. And it also, when we talk about healthy eating, we actually want to include a certain amount of fat in healthy eating. So it's not about low fat diets anymore. You shouldn't be looking for 0% fat in everything you eat. That isn't the goal. So what we wanna do is not focus on low fat diets anymore, but how to include healthy fats, particularly heart healthy fats in your diet. And that's what we're gonna talk about. So let's do a bit of an overview. If you were to classify fats as heart healthy and less healthy for the heart, on the heart healthy side, we have what we call unsaturated fats. We've got a whole bunch of different kinds. I won't test you on them, but we, we wanna know about, there's monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, and then underneath polyunsaturated fats, those are the ones you probably recognize, omega-3 fatty acids. And we'll talk a lot about those because those are really important when it comes to heart health. Now on the heart unhealthy side, we talk about saturated fats, but primarily those saturated fats that come from animal foods, we're gonna talk a, a lot more about. And then we have trans fat, little less important nowadays, but we'll talk about the significance of those as well. So let's talk about the heart unhealthy side first. So this is what we call saturated fats. Now, saturated fats are found in higher amounts in animal-based foods, right? So think of marbling in a piece of red meat, okay? Or think of chicken wings or high fat dairy foods or the skin on poultry. That's where there's more saturated fat. And so what we want to do is we want to lower that amount of animal fat in the diet because what we know is if we have a large amount of those kinds of fats in the diet, it increases your risk for developing heart disease. It can increase that lousy LDL cholesterol and we know a higher LDL cholesterol puts a higher risk for heart disease. So a really good rule of thumb when it comes to saturated fats is that it tends to be solid at room temperature. So think of the, mar the fat in meat or butter or lard or something like that. Those tend to be solid at room temperature. And the some exception would be certain tropical oils like coconut oil ha is um, a little bit solid at room temperature. It's a little bit of both, right? A little solid, a little liquid. Um, so those are a bit of an exception to the rule. Um, but the interesting thing about saturated fats that come from plants like coconut and palm is that they don't seem to have the same negative effect on our blood cholesterol as the animal-based ones do. Now that doesn't mean we can eat all the coconut oil and all the coconut we want, um, but we know that it doesn't have the same detrimental effect that as much as animal-based fats. So that's why we talk about animal sourced fats like uh, beef and chicken and pork and things like that, okay? So let's talk a little bit more about, do you remember low-fat diets? Ah, uh, yes, we all remember those. Low-fat diets were when the time, it was probably the late 90s, early 2000s, where we thought fat was a real problem when it came to heart disease. And so people started getting recommendations to lower the fat in their diet, and as a result, people started eating more what we call refined carbohydrates. What are refined carbohydrates? Refined carbohydrates are things like white rice, white bread, um, a lot of white pasta, um, pastries, uh, cookies, um, soda pop, things like that. So because they're quick, they're convenient, they taste pretty good, people started replacing the fat in their diet with those foods. And guess what happened? We saw rates of heart disease increased by 33%. So we didn't lower our risk for heart disease, which had a lot of people scratching their heads because we thought, well, if fat is the problem and we cut out the fat, why didn't it improve things? 
So what we know is that there's two main things that impact our heart disease risk. So one is, yes, the animal sources of saturated fats do, do play a role, but it's not the only thing. So it's not just total fat, it's type of fat, but now we also know refined carbohydrates play a role too. So we wanna consider those um, and consider, it's not saying that carbs are bad, it's about saying the quality of the carbohydrate choices people made weren't as nutritious. So that's the bottom line there. So let's pivot and talk about heart healthy fats, like unsaturated fats. Now there are a whole bunch of different kinds. You don't need to know all the names of them. But what's interesting to know about it is when people include more of these types of fats in the diet, which tend to be more plant fats, um, we see the lousy LDL cholesterol start to go down. And this is really significant because when we see a lower LDL cholesterol, we see a lower risk in heart disease, which is really significant. And that's the kinds of things we wanna look at. Now, the rule of thumb for these guys is that they tend to be really soft or liquid at room temperature. So think of your canola oil and your olive oil and soft margarines made from healthy oils. So those guys tend to be, um, you know, a rough rule of thumb to give you a, an idea. So monounsaturated fat would include things like your olive oil, canola oil, um, margarines made from those oils. Now we call those margarines non-hydrogenated margarines. That's significant because, um, so you probably know some of those, you know, popular brand names out there like Basel and Celeste and there's some other ones, um, but it should say non-hydrogenate on the lid. That just means that they don't incorporate unhealthy fats in the making of those margarines if you use margarines. Almonds are an, also an excellent source of monounsaturated fats as well. Now, polyunsaturated fats are pretty much all the other vegetable oils out there. So corn, sunflower, safflower, um, soybean, walnut, sesame seeds, and then we also have a type of monounsaturated fat is also called omega-3 fatty acids. So omega-3 fatty acids, we know the single richest source of omega-3 fatty acids in the diet is fish, right? So it's a really easy way. That's why we hear a lot about fish, um, eat your salmon and stuff like that. It doesn't have to be salmon, but we certainly hear that a lot. Flaxseed is also a very rich source of omega-3s, chia seeds, soybeans, walnuts. Um, you can get omega-3 enriched foods, right? You can get omega-3 eggs and cereals and juices and stuff like that. So let's talk about omega-3s because we know this is really important when we talk about um, the heart. Now, this slide is showing you um, the omega-3s. If you took all the evidence that we have on heart disease and omega-3s specifically, this gives you kind of the Coles Notes version of all the really important benefits that we've seen with omega-3 fatty acids. So decreasing unhealthy fats in the bloodstream, preventing irregular heart rhythms, um, decreasing stickiness of blood cells so the blood flows more readily, right? That's really important. If you have any narrowing in your arteries, we want the blood to flow really easily and not get caught up. When the blood is stickier, it can get more caught up in narrowed parts of the arteries. Less likely to see blood clots, right? There's a very, very mild blood thinning effect when we have a healthy amount of omega-3s in the diet. Um, and less buildup of things like cholesterol in the blood vessels. And then inflammation is a big one when we talk about heart disease. So controlling inflammation is really significant when we talk about um, getting enough omega-3s in the diet. So that is kind of a huge list. When we look at other nutrients and nutrition, we don't see probably benefits that significant. So that's why um, we talk a lot about omega-3s. So let's keep talking about omega-3s. Omega-3s we know are found in really high amounts in fish, but how much should we, should we aim for? So ideally what we wanna aim for is about two servings a week of fish. It's about the size of the palm of your hand, maybe a little bit bigger, maybe about three quarters of a cup of canned fish counts as well. Um, and you could have that. It doesn't have to be um, perfectly grilled salmon twice a week. It could be canned, it could be fresh, it could be frozen fish. We talk a lot about salmon primarily because it's really an oily fish. And when you have more oil in the fish, you have more omega-3s. But that doesn't mean all the fish you eat has to be higher, high, oilier fish like that. So um, 
The alternative, if you can't eat fish, you're allergic to fish or anything like that, would be to consider a supplement. So for supplements, what we would recommend is a, at least one gram or a thousand milligrams of a supplement where it says that EPA, DHA, omega-3s in it are about that amount. And you can have, you can talk to a pharmacist about that. You can check the side of the label if you want to. Um, the benefits of, of getting omegas from the omega-3s from food specifically seem to be better. We're not quite sure why that is, but we wonder if perhaps there are other compounds in food that allow your body to use that nutrient specifically more effectively. So a lot of the studies on omega-3 supplements specifically haven't shown really wonderful benefits. It's been really mixed. Some have shown benefits, some have shown nothing, and some have shown no benefit. So it's hard to know specifically. Uh, the guideline is still there. So we would still say if you want to take a supplement because you can't eat fish or can't use flaxseed or other alternatives of omega-3s, you could definitely consider a supplement. If you're unsure, definitely talk to a registered dietitian, your pharmacist, or your family physician about any of those things. In fact, anytime you, you take a supplement, even if it's off the shelf, we always recommend that you talk to a health professional, specifically your family physician, uh, just to make sure there are no interactions with other prescriptions that you might be taking or other alternative medicines you might be including just to make sure there's no interaction between the two. Even though something is considered natural or comes from nature in some way, it can still be potent, it can still cause problems if it interacts with something it shouldn't interact with. So more just to keep you knowledgeable and make informed choices rather than to make you feel worried about it. We also know from a supplement point of view for omega-3s, there's a maximum. So we know that in cases where people took three grams or more of a supplement, of the omega-3 supplement specifically, we saw the risk for bleeding went up. A lot of people in cardiac rehab who've had a heart event have already been prescribed medications like aspirin or Plavix or Berlinta, all of which help make the blood flow really smoothly and thin it in a certain way. So we don't wanna to add to that by taking excessive amounts of a supplement. More is not better in this case. So if you're unsure, definitely chat with your health professional about that to, so that you feel safe and you feel informed and sure about what you're doing. Some of the best sources of omega-3 fatty acids come from fatty fish, cold water fatty fish specifically, um, seafood counts as well. As I mentioned, it could be fresh, it could be frozen, it could be canned. Now, the one things that we don't count are fish and chips. I know they taste great, but they're not exactly a super powerhouse nutritious food. Have it for a treat sometimes, but we won't count it as one of your fish servings for the week, sadly. Um, the fattier the fish, the more omega-3s in it, but that doesn't mean that's what is required of you. If you like white fish better or you know lake trout, totally fine those still count. If you don't like fresh fish and you prefer canned fish like sardines or tuna or salmon or other things like that, that's fine too, that counts. So definitely um, you could include that as a serving of fish in your diet as well. If you're vegetarian or you can't eat fish because of allergies, there are other plant-based sources of omega-3s that you could get in your diet. So you could consider flaxseed. Now, a little tip about flaxseed is that flaxseed works way better when it's ground up. So if you buy whole flaxseed from the store and you have a coffee grinder at home, you could buy the whole flaxseed, grind up what you need, and you'll get a lot more benefit from it. The little husk on the flaxseed is really tough. And so even your highly acidic stomach environment really can't break it down completely. So when you eat whole flaxseed, it kind of goes all the way through you. And so you don't get the same benefit as if you grind it up. So definite little tip there. Now, the other thing that works is chia seeds. So chia seeds work really well. Um, soybeans, so if you've ever had edamame at a Japanese restaurant, you can also buy them frozen. Edamame are baby soybeans, that's all they are. And you can buy them out of the shell in a frozen bag in most grocery stores. Or if you feel fancy, you can order out and get someone else to cook it for you. All right, and then we talked about the breaded fish products in terms of the fish and chips kind of idea. I think if you think of the frozen breaded fish that you buy in the grocery store, the omega-3s and those guys, pretty low. 
Think of how many steps that little fishy had to go through before it ended up in the box with the breading on it, right? It's a lot of steps, so you lose a lot of nutrition along the way. So occasionally having it, if it's a favorite of yours, no problem. But because the omega levels are pretty low in those guys, we don't count them um, to the same extent that we would other sources. Okay, so hopefully that all makes sense. Um, some people ask me about risks and benefits um, about heavy metals and fish. This is a really good question because I think what we want to consider is maybe where the fish comes from. You know, maybe you're considering um, some food regulations in other countries are maybe not as uh, strict and uh, heavily regulated as we would be in perhaps North America. But what we know is that a lot of the readily available fishes that we buy in Canada are actually very, very low in mercury content. So it's very safe to consume in the amounts that are recommended. Um, some of the fish that do have higher levels of these heavy metals are typically really large fish. So think shark and marlin and, and uh, swordfish and those guys. Um, those are more common perhaps in more tropical waters. So if you were lucky enough to um, vacation down south for a while and you have that more, uh, more often, the Health Canada does have guidelines to help guide us in eating those types of fish. Those fish live a lot longer, so they have more time to accumulate those metals in their flesh. So, um, but the Health Canada guidelines indicate that for Vulnerable populations like frail elderly, um, immunocompromised people, so if you're having chemotherapy or something like that, um, or if you're uh, breastfeeding or, um, or anything like that, or pregnant woman, then you might not have those types of fish more than twice a week. I think for the rest of us, probably less of an issue, right? Probably not consuming those types of fish quite that frequently. So. All right, so I think that's rounded out omega-3s really nicely. I want to really just touch on trans fats for a moment. So what we know about trans fats, we have some naturally occurring trans fats in dairy products. We don't get fussed about those guys. The trans fats we worry about are the ones that are manufactured. So this is when food manufacturers use um, less expensive fats in food manufacturing. What it does is it actually improves the shelf life of foods. Um, it improves the texture of a lot of foods so they can sit on the store shelves for longer. So they make more money when it sits longer and more people can buy it. Makes sense. Now what's interesting is back in 2018, um, Canada uh, banned the use of these less um, healthy fats so that trans fats were essentially banned in a lot of processed foods in Canada. So if you think about foods that are more commonly uh, to have trans fats in it, think of a lot of highly processed foods. So in this case, we would call them ultra processed foods. So these would be things like potato chips and, you know, um, muffins that are baked outside of your home, things like that, a lot of baked goods, some french fries in some cases, um, frozen dinners in some cases, or frozen foods uh, that were uh, very common to have some of these fats in it. So in Canada's case, um, because they banned the use of these trans fats, uh, it's very unlikely you'll see trans fats on the labels anymore. Now, if you travel outside of Canada, um, you may wanna be more mindful of things like that, where they may not have the same regulations in place. So we don't have to worry so much about it anymore, but we certainly understood the, the risk for trans fat consumption was as high as consuming, you know, those animal saturated fats I talked about earlier. So something good to know, but less, less of an issue in Canada now. So let's finish up everything on fat. So the bottom line when it comes to fat, if I was standing in front of you with two teaspoons in my hand and one teaspoon had butter in it and one teaspoon had olive oil in it, do you know what? They both contain exactly the same amount of grams of fat and calories, exactly the same. And a lot of people scratch their head and they say, but didn't you just spend the last few minutes telling me all about the benefits of, you know, liquid oils and stuff like that? I did. So it's not about lower calorie eating. It's about choosing different kinds of fats, right? So choosing the canola oil or the olive oil more often than the hard fats means that you can have a, a a benefit. You'll see a difference in terms of cholesterol numbers in the blood and stuff like that. And that's what we're looking for. So maybe an example might be eating fish once a week and removing red meat out of one of those, those meals that you might have a week. So what you're doing essentially is you're substituting 
unsaturated fat in place of something that's very high in saturated fat and improving the fat profile even of that week, right? So that would be an example of it, maybe how you would substitute one in and pull one out. And, and that's definitely one way to do it. So it's okay to include all different kinds of fats in the diet. So if you really love to have a hamburger on the barbecue in the summer, it's okay. You can still have that. But you might consider other types of burgers sometimes. Maybe you would try a salmon burger or a chicken burger or a turkey burger or a bean burger or something like that. There are different options out there so that you can still have the burger, but maybe it's not always a beef burger. Or maybe you consider leaner ground beef than what you're usually buying. So all of those things that I've talked about isn't saying you can't have this, you can't have that. No, I mean, all foods pretty much fit, but you're gonna be more mindful and more thoughtful about how often you might have them or how much you're gonna eat, those kinds of things, okay? So I think the key factor is what you replace saturated fats with, right? So if you're taking some saturated fat out of the diet, we want to consider heart healthy fats to include. Um, if you're going to add some carbohydrates in your diet, like grains, make sure they're good quality grains, like whole grains instead of the refined grains. Okay. So those kinds of things we want to consider. So now we're going to talk about fiber. Okay. Fiber is one of the components of a healthy diet that I think a lot of us forget about. We don't really give fiber the, the kind of um, air time it deserves. Fiber, if you think of it simplistically, is the part of plants our bodies can't process and digest. Interesting, right? So think of it like a bit of a broom that goes through your body, cleans things out, keeps things healthy, keeps things moving along, as you know. And so we want to consider about when we have more fiber in the diet, we see lower rates of diabetes, we see lower rates of heart disease. Interesting. So how do those guys play in? So one of the things fiber does really well and my favorite part of fiber is it makes you feel full and satisfied. So guess what? It's a natural portion controller. So when you eat foods that have more fiber in it, you feel more satisfied, you push away from the table, you've had enough. And that's because your body's saying, I'm good, you're good. You don't need to keep sort of shoveling it in. When you eat low fiber foods, you don't have the fiber to fill you up. Now you need volume of food to fill you up. So it's no wonder that if you have a big bowl of white rice, your small bowl is not going to fill you up. You want a bigger bowl because you need the amount now to make you feel full because the fiber is too low. So there's that. Let's talk about types of fiber. So when we talk about fiber, there are two different main types of fiber. We have soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. Now they both work on the body in slightly different ways, but they're both important. And so it's not about picking one over the other. It's more about just getting a nice balance of both of them. So let's start about uh, let's start with soluble fiber first because soluble fiber is one you probably heard about. You know you probably heard something about oatmeal and cholesterol, right? That eating oatmeal is really good at lowering cholesterol, for example. Well, one of the reasons why oatmeal is effective at low, helping to lower cholesterol is in part because it's got a lot of soluble fiber in it. And soluble fiber acts to help absorb some of the extra cholesterol in the body. And so that's why we see some improvements when people eat um, oatmeal regularly. Now, oatmeal doesn't count when it's got um, lots of maple syrup and cinnamon and brown sugar and all those things in it. I mean, there's still benefits to it, but when you add a lot of things to it or you buy the flavored packages, it's lost a little bit of its nutrition. So let's talk about other soluble fiber containing foods. So think of oat bran, oatmeal, psyllium fiber is found in a lot of breakfast cereals, for example, legumes like lentils, right? So we've got some lentils here. So these guys have a lot of soluble fiber in them. And when you include them in the diet, they can actually be really helpful at lowering cholesterol as well. So we also have things like root vegetables. So think of like turnips, um, sweet potatoes, um, apples and strawberries have a lot of soluble fiber as well. So soluble fiber is well known to help lower that lousy LDL cholesterol when you eat enough of it in your diet. Now that doesn't mean you have to start eating lentils every single day, but having lentils in your diet maybe more often than you do, would be a way that you could incorporate some of that healthy fiber um, in your day-to-day -day eating. And those are the kinds of things that matter. Now, 
insoluble fiber is a little different. This is the stuff that helps keep us regular, right? So now you're thinking wheat bran, right? So you're thinking of um, whole grains like brown rice, you're thinking of whole grain pastas or cereals or things like that. Um, the skin of a lot of fruits and vegetables have a lot of insoluble fiber. So this is what keeps our body regular, right? So we're less likely to have problems in our digestive tract when we eat a lot of these types of foods. Now, if we put fiber into context, we need about 25 to 50 grams, roughly, of fiber every day. Now, the lower amount would be more for women and the higher amount would be more for men. Um, up to 50 grams for men with diabetes, 25 to 35 grams is typically what we recommend for people without diabetes, roughly in there. So men get the higher amount, women have the slightly lower end, as women tend to be a bit smaller frame, so lower needs of fiber. So if we put the fiber into context, what does 25 grams of fiber look like? So if you look at something like a bowl of cornflakes, now this isn't cornflakes specifically, but a bowl about this size, this is about one cup of cereal. Um, in, if it's cornflakes, guess how many grams of fiber it has? Zero, nothing. There's no fiber in cornflakes or Rice Krispies or Special K. So those guys are really, really low in fiber. Now, if you say to me, Samantha, those are my favorite cereals in the whole wide world. I can't give it up, what do I do? And I say, well, what I would do is mix it. So maybe you get some bran flakes, maybe that's not your favorite, but if you mix it with your lower fiber cereal, like cornflakes, you boost up the fiber now by having some higher fiber cereal plus a low fiber cereal. It's a little workaround, little hack that you could do to boost up the fiber so you don't have to give up your favorite foods, but you get a little bit more fiber that way. Now, if we go down the list, there's a large number of grams of fiber in a bunch of different things, like in say that, um, that quick oats oatmeal, about this size, Again, close to nine grams of fiber. That's pretty significant, right? And in something like the bran flakes, this guy here, um, you're gonna get about five grams. Um, so that's pretty good for, um, for something like breakfast cereal. If you're not a breakfast cereal kind of person, maybe half a cup of blueberries, you could consider half a cup of blueberries is about four grams of fiber. So, and it's a really nice way to say, if you think about you can't meet your fiber needs in, with one food or even at one meal. We're going to be looking at getting fiber from the whole day. But breakfast is a great meal to start with because this is typically when we eat a lot of grains, maybe fruit in the morning. So it's a great way to work in higher fiber options, whether it's in bread or other grains like cereals, whether it's hot cereal, cold cereal, things like that are more common or working in um, fruit as well. So you could maybe add fruit to a cereal or you could have um, something else with, your, with bread or something like that in the morning. And then something like a lentil soup could run you about 12 grams, like a small bowl of lentil soup um, at lunch or a dal or something like that with some basmati rice. That would be a way to bump up your fiber as well. So eating more of those plant foods, great way to get a little bit more fiber in your diet. Um, it doesn't have to be sort of uh, the brand buds rabbit kind of food every day on cereal. If you like it, that's great. You can sprinkle it on top of yogurt or another cereal if you like. If that's not your cup of tea, there's loads of others to find that'll, that'll give you a little fiber boost. Now, here's my fiber tip. If you forget everything else I say, remember this one. Increase your fiber slowly. Slow and easy increases in fiber. So don't go crazy on the super high fiber cereal you found in the grocery store and feel really proud of yourself for eating it. That's great, but have smaller amounts slowly over time. Drink lots of fluids, right? So when you drink lots of fluids, um, whether it's water or tea or coffee, those count as fluids or soups or things like that. Your body uses the fiber better when you have more fluids that you're taking in at the same time as the fiber. So those are the kinds of things you wanna do. The other thing that makes fiber work really well in the body is moving your body, right? So being active, whether it's for walks or a light cycle or something like that, all of those things count. Uh, working in the garden or things like that, we wanna make sure you, when you move your body, it's easier for your muscles and your digestive system to push things through so it makes it from the start to the finish, okay? And that is everything we're gonna talk about on fiber. 
So next we're going to talk a little bit about the Canada's Food Guide. Now the Canada's Food Guide got updated recently and I want to show you a picture of it because it's a really interesting change in how we look at food guides. The food guide used to be more of a cartoon rainbow, right? We talked a lot about serving sizes and stuff like that. We don't do that anymore. Now we're looking at balance. I love this idea of balance and I've talked about balance for years when I've met with patients because sometimes moderation is hard to define right? Some an idea of moderation might be different than someone else's. But balance is pretty easy. When you look at a dinner plate like this and you see things laid out in kind of different groups, so we have things laid out with protein, with grains, and then fruits and vegetables. And all, as you see on this plate, the vegetables and the fruit take up half the plate, the protein takes up a quarter of a plate, and then grains take up the other quarter of the plate. Why is this important? Well, Protein is really filling. Protein foods are things like beef, chicken, eggs, fish, lentils, nuts, seeds, soy, Greek yogurt, all of those guys show up in there. Okay, protein is really neutral on blood sugars. So if you have diabetes, that's something that you wanna know about. It's also filling. When we eat protein, it gives your body a sense of satiety and satisfaction when we eat. When you pair that protein up with a whole grain, like brown rice, or maybe something like quinoa, right? Quinoa is a great grain. We also, you can also get these rice medleys where they have brown rice, wild rice, even white rice, but it's all mixed together. That's a way to get um, more um, grains into your diet, or maybe like a whole grain pasta. Um, you could look at oats as a way to get whole grain, barley, things like that or whole grain bread even. Um, when you get more of the whole grain, we just talked about fiber being really filling too. So when you have the fullness of the protein, that satisfaction of the high fiber, when you pair those together, you feel fuller for longer. And then the idea of the vegetables and fruit on the other side of the plate, they're just taking up real estate, right? So you don't take huge portions of the other guys, right? Now the lines on the plate, this plate is perfectly styled. It looks so beautiful, but this is not showing you portion sizes. So this is not saying you're only allowed this like tiny little piece of bread. So don't worry about that. It's more about proportions. So think about roughly how much of your plate is being taken up by all of these different foods. Again, it doesn't have to be perfectly half quarter quarter. It might look like thirds. It might depend on the meal. But the idea is try to get a balance of those three things as best as you can, but three meals a day, right? Not just dinner. So what we want to do is maybe at breakfast you have oatmeal and the oatmeal is your grain and maybe you make it with milk or you add nuts on top and that's the protein and then maybe you add some fruit as well. If it's on the side or on top, doesn't matter. That could be a balance, right? And the same idea goes for lunch and dinner, right? So dinner, maybe it's more separated out. Maybe lunch, it's like a really hearty soup or a stew. Or it's, um, like I said, it could be dal with, with roti or um, like a chapati, so it'd be whole grain. Or it could be a basmati rice. And then you would have some vegetables with it. Could be raw, cooked, doesn't matter. Get Throw some veggies in there and then you get that balance again. And so those are the different ways you're going to use that food guide to help you kind of eyeball it. You're not weighing your food. You're not measuring your food. You're just sort of looking at your plate going roughly, how am I doing when I serve it all out? Okay. Now it's interesting when we talk about the Canada's food guide that a lot of people ask me about, well, I keep hearing about this Mediterranean diet. Tell me a little bit more about that. And it's interesting that there is a lot of overlap between the Canada's food guide and the Mediterranean diet. Now the Mediterranean diet is illustrated slightly differently. They use a pyramid. And the idea behind this pyramid is the bottom of the pyramid is the largest. And this is where we have all the plants. So fruits, vegetables, whole grains, olive oil, nuts and seeds, legumes like lentils and chickpeas and all those guys. And because it's the biggest part of the pyramid, we wanna eat more from this part. The next level up is fish and seafood. The next level up is poultry, eggs, cheese, and yogurt. And now we're at the very, very smallest part of the pyramid, the tip. And this is where we have red meat and sweets. So think of like sugar added treats and stuff like that. Very yummy, but we just, we don't want to eliminate them. We just want to have them a little less often. And so the interesting part of the food guide is it's giving you a more practical aim for this on your plate. 
And the Mediterranean diet is giving you a different practical where it's saying overall, not just on your plate, but overall in your diet, have more plants, more fish, a little bit of poultry and dairy, but not too much of the sweets and the red meat at the very top. So hopefully that makes sense when you see it all laid out like that. So now let's talk about the practical stuff. It's lovely to talk about guidelines and recommendations, and those are important, especially when we talk about how to make our heart healthier. But a lot of my patients say to me, you know, like, what do I do when I go home? Or what do I do when I go to the grocery store? So let's talk about the really practical stuff. Now, some of this might be review for you. Some of this might be new. So we'll go and we'll just pick and choose which ones work for you. So when we talk about choosing leaner cuts of meat, you probably, a lot of you know, maybe consider skinless chicken or look for leaner cuts of red meat, things like that. Or if you want to get adventurous and you haven't tried plant proteins yet, maybe you try a recipe that might use something like lentils, right? So this is important. This is going to help you kind of maybe move out of your comfort zone in terms of trying a new recipe or something like that. Now, when it comes to um, processed meats, it gets a little bit more complicated. So things like deli meats, um, sausages, bacon, stuff like that, again, I am of the belief that you don't need to give up all foods in the diet to be healthy. But if you were having, you know, a cook up once a week and you had sausages and eggs and bacon and stuff like that, you might want to consider how much you have of those foods and how often, right? So again, when you have it less often, you appreciate it more than when you have it more frequently, don't you find, right? I, I get they taste great and diets aren't about making you feel deprived right? That's not, that's a, usually a sign of a bad diet. Someone once said, if the diet makes you sad, it's not a good diet. And I think that's a great way to look at it. It's simplistic, but it makes sense, right? Um, so we want to be mindful about our choices. We want to make good choices because it makes you and your body feel good. And so that is usually the motivation for people to keep making those kinds of healthy choices. Um, so we talked about um, lentils a lot and other legumes. So consider other plant proteins like chickpeas or kidney beans or other types of split peas, things like that, or different types of lentils um, as a way to get some proteins in the diet. And maybe what you do is create a soup or a stew where there's plant proteins in it, but there's also meat in it. If you're a meat person and you want to say, you know what, I want chicken, you know, because it makes me feel like I like the flavor of it or something like that, but you could still add beans to it, right? It could be like a really kind of interesting play on a minestrone soup, right? But kind of really fusion-y and kind of mixing different types of ingredients in there. So that's a, that's a way to kind of work in both, right? Um, we need to talk about eggs. This is probably one of the top 10 um, myths that I encounter daily. So people say to me, um, you know, my health professional or I read or my family member told me I shouldn't eat eggs because eggs are high in cholesterol. So to be clear, eggs do contain dietary cholesterol. And what that means is in the yolk specifically, there's more dietary cholesterol in it. What's interesting about this is we actually have quite a lot of scientific evidence that points to the fact that dietary cholesterol doesn't directly contribute to an increase in your blood levels of cholesterol. They should really give them different names because it's too confusing. So cholesterol doesn't raise cholesterol. So that doesn't mean we can go ahead and eat all the eggs and shrimp cocktails we want, but we certainly know in moderation, eggs are an incredibly nutritious food. They offer a lot of nutrition. A lot of the nutrition is in the yolk. There's still some nutrition in the, in the white as well. Um, some people, if they want to have eggs more frequently, might do one egg and one white if they're going to have it more daily. Um, there's no real set guidelines for eggs, and I think this is where it gets complicated. Um, for people who have no heart disease, um, it's roughly about one egg a day. So that's about seven eggs in a week. For people with diabetes and with heart disease, there is a rough range of about zero to four eggs a week. This is mostly because we don't know what happens when people consume a large number of eggs. So if people started eating 14 or more eggs a week, we can't say with absolute certainty that it's not going to cause any changes in body chemistry or anything like that. We don't really know. In some studies, in small studies, they found some potential issues. 
but it's a really small study. It wasn't one that we can hang our hat on and say, this is such a rigorous study, we have to change all our guidelines. No, that's not how scientific um, studies work. So what we know is, in moderation, eggs can be a very helpful choice. They're so versatile, you can have it at any meal, right? Really works. But what we do know is um, eggs are really nutritious. And so if you don't get a lot of other protein in your diet, say you hardly eat any meat, maybe you're vegetarian but eat eggs, then you could probably be more liberal with your egg intake because it's a main source of protein for you. If you're someone who, what we call omnivorous, so you eat a bit of everything, so red meat, chicken, pork, all this stuff, and you're eating nuts and eggs and all that kind of stuff too, then you might be more careful about how many eggs you might incorporate in your diet depending on how much of the other animal sources you're including. So hopefully that makes sense. So the idea is it's not a hard stop at four, right? So if you eat, you know, three eggs one week, six eggs another week, two eggs another week, and no eggs the last week, if you average it out for that whole month, you're probably still well within those guidelines. And again, and I mentioned this again, the guidelines are pretty rough. They're not sort of really set in stone, okay? So hopefully that helps set the record straight about eggs. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about more healthy tips. So I can't believe I have to say this, but I say this anyway, eat your fruits and vegetables every day, every day. And some people would say, of course I would do that. And other people go, oh yeah, I guess I should eat them every day. So certainly wh whoever this speaks to, we do want you to eat vegetables every day and fruit every day. A lot of people say, I don't like to eat fruit every day because fruit has sugar. We don't get fussed about naturally occurring sugar in fruit, even if you have diabetes. We still want you to eat fruit. Fruit contains an incredible number of vitamins and minerals. It contains fiber. We even know it contains sort of um, antioxidants. Antioxidants can be helpful, we think, with maybe helping immune system and fighting off little bad guys roaming around in our bodies that shouldn't be there. So fruits and vegetables are really, really important. Now, we emphasize eating the fruit and the vegetables over drinking it, right? So here we have, it's not real, see, upside down. But it's, this is about what half a cup of orange juice looks like, right? This doesn't seem like a lot. This is sort of like the, the size of juice cups my grandma had, and this is all you got. But our glass sizes have changed, haven't they? So sometimes the glass sizes gets bigger, we maybe drink more of the juices because it's really tasty, it's really nice, it's an easy way to get fruit, but it's a lot more concentrated fruit sugar in this amount. Also consider, how long does it take you to drink a glass of juice? Not long, right? How long does it take you to peel and eat and section an orange? A whole lot longer. So the whole process of peeling it, chewing it, swallowing it takes longer than this. So the sugar, even though it's naturally occurring sugar, will get converted to the fuel your body likes to use for fuel for your brain and your muscles and everything um, a little slower than if you were to down a glass of juice really quickly. Okay, so that's why we talk about eating the piece of fruit instead of juicing it, right? So those kinds of things we want to do. And even with vegetable juices, there are some exceptions for people who cannot eat vegetables, really hate vegetables. Um, we, work, we try to work with people trying to incorporate favorite vegetables as best as they can. Um, or maybe sometimes they'll use a little bit of low sodium vegetable juice as a way to get them. But for most people who are eating vegetables and fruit pretty regularly, we want you to eat them as much as you can as opposed to drink them. So that's definitely one thing we want to do. Um, Sometimes when I talk about um, dressings and sauces, we want to watch how often we have creamy sauces like Thousand Island dressing and ranch and Caesar and Alfredo sauces and stuff like that. That doesn't mean you can't have it. If you go out and you have a really favorite restaurant and they have this wonderful pasta dish and it's your favorite thing on the menu, then treat yourself sometimes. But maybe you're not gonna make that as re uh, regularly at home on your own and always do. Maybe consider other ways to um, cook up your pasta. Maybe you use a tomato-based sauce or an olive oil-based kind of um, topping on top of your pasta instead of always a creamy sauce. So just things like that to keep in mind. Okay, we talked a lot about fiber. So we talked a lot about aiming for high fiber, whole grains. We talked about, you know, higher fiber rices you can get. Um, it's going to give you a little bit more fullness and satisfaction. We talked about other grains like quinoa, barley, millet, spelt. There's lots of other ones out there um, that can give you uh, 
just a different grain instead of always having the same thing, right? Doesn't always have to look the same. Um, we need to talk a little bit about dairy. Um, there's some really interesting um, studies out there about dairy. So it's not about like everything has to be 0%. No, we have some studies that show the higher fat dairy isn't necessarily um, super harmful or anything like that, but it really depends on how much and how often. And I think that's really hard to define. So often when I meet with people one-on-one, -on -one, we talk about what they're, what you're eating and we go through that together. And that's where the individuality of meeting with a dietitian is important. But for purposes today where we're trying to get a bigger audience, we basically say anything from zero to 2% milk fat is fine for milk and yogurt and and cottage cheese and stuff like that right just for those purposes um, if you put a bit of cream in your coffee don't sweat it if you have seven coffees a day and it's all double double we'll talk after class but really the idea is just being mindful of what you're using and how much right so those kinds of things uh, make a difference now i get a lot of people asking me about cheese it's a tricky one cheese because um, it's so darn tasty and so i like cheese too and you know if you're eating cheese every day or you're having it always on a sandwich every day you might consider some lower fat cheese options I know it doesn't taste the same but sometimes you can find pretty tasty cheeses um, that are around 20% milk fat and if you look on the front of the package of cheese there'll be a little percentages now one of the percentages will be moisture and one will be MF and the MF stands for milk fat and so sometimes you could look at like a goat cheese is a perfect example of a naturally lower fat uh, cheese choice that's roughly about 20-21% milk fat. So that could work. Um, if you're using a cheddar, like a really extra aged old cheddar, it might run you closer to 31 to 35% milk fat. That's not saying it's off the, off the option list, but you could definitely have a little bit of that, but maybe what you do is you have it as a cheese course, as a special occasion on, I don't know, a Friday night and you have some fruit and you have some cheese and really nice crackers, maybe a glass of something to go with it. So all of those together make it feel more special. And when it's more special, you appreciate it differently than if you just go, yep, I'm throwing on my cheese on my sandwich every day because that's the way I do it. Maybe mix it up and try other options as well. Okay, so cheese is okay. Consider some low fat sometimes, like if you're making your own pizza, maybe you choose um, a lower fat mozzarella because really the cheese is really just gluing everything on so all the toppings don't fall off. So you, that's not really the star of the show. Maybe you put really cool toppings on and it tastes really good because you have interesting toppings. Um, this is where I might put goat cheese on my pizza. Yeah, call me crazy, but goat cheese on pizza is like the best thing ever. So consider that as an option too. So you have a bunch of different options. You don't have to cut anything out completely, but it's about how much, how often. So think about those kinds of things when you're looking at um, choices like that. Now, we are going to move on to talking a bit about sodium. Sodium, we probably all recognize sodium as being a potential issue in our diet. Um, I think a lot of us understand that we could get too much of it in our diet pretty easily. Um, and it's not just from the salt shaker. So it's not just what you shaky shake on your, on your dinner at the table. Most of us have probably taken, you know, um, salt off the dinner table mostly for a lot of people I talk to certainly say that. Um, but it's actually most of the sodium in our diet comes from outside the home. So if you think about 11% of our sodium intake comes from um, what you add at the table or what you add in cooking. And about 75% of the sodium intake in our diet comes from restaurant meals, takeout, uh, processed foods, right? That's a really large amount and that comes from outside of the home typically. So when we're looking at different products like soup stock as an example, we want to consider something like sodium could potentially be really high in this. So what we're going to talk about is how do we, how do we consider those options? So I want you to think what comes to mind when you think of hidden sources of sodium in the diet, right? Some of them aren't so hidden, right? Some of them are really obvious. Like I think a lot of people recognize canned goods and frozen dinners as two really big ones, right? But there's other ones that are sneaking around that maybe you don't notice, like maybe consider your breakfast cereal, right? Or your loaf of bread. 
those kinds of things might have sodium in it, a little higher than what we recommend. Um, but we don't always consider those because they don't maybe taste salty, right, when you taste it. And so those are the kinds of things. Now, the interesting thing about sodium is this is a mineral. We actually have sodium in our body right now. It's an important mineral. If we didn't have sodium in our body, we would die. We need this mineral. It's really important for life. One of the main functions it does is it helps balance out fluid levels in the body, right? So when we take salt, maybe you have a really salty meal. Do you ever feel like you're retaining water? Yeah, that's what sodium does. It hangs on to water and fluids in the body and it makes you feel kind of bloated and funny. And then the, and then the next day, once the body's worked it through, the kidneys have filtered it all out, you kind of feel better again. But that's part of maybe you seeing sodium in action. So what we know is salt is um, made up of sodium. It's also made up of another mineral called chloride. So we have table salt, which is probably roughly 40% sodium and 60% chloride. A lot of people ask me about other types of salt, like sea salt, the really pretty Himalayan salt. You know, it's pink, it's really, you think it's fancy and it does look fancy, but is it more nutritious? Is it superior than regular old like pouring table salt? It's not really. Right? So sea salt is about 39% sodium. Um, it's got a few other trace minerals in it, which is way, why I think a lot of people thought it might be more nutritious. Um, but it's really not in terms of how the body uses it and stuff like that. It's not necessarily different. It tastes different. Right? So if you are a gourmet, you're a foodie, you love you know, using certain types of flavors in your cooking, fine, that's great. But certainly it's not nutritionally better one than the other. Right? So consider that. So um, when, if you look at the tip of your thumb, that's about the size of a teaspoon. So if you had a teaspoon of salt, that contains 2,375 milligrams of sodium. Okay, why is that important? Well, it's important because we're talking about um, the limits of sodium that we recommend in Canada. So in Canada, we have a couple of different levels. So we have something called the UL or the upper limit. The upper limit in Canada for sodium for a whole day is about 2,300 milligrams a day, okay? Well, we just said a whole little tiny teaspoon of salt is basically exceeding that already. So that's significant. If you have high blood pressure or you take medication to manage your blood pressure, um, the limit becomes 1,500 to 2,300 milligrams. So that's 1,500 milligrams of sodium to 2,300 milligrams of sodium. Um, and we call that the adequate intake is about 1,500 milligrams a day. So if you have high blood pressure, we're giving you a range between the adequate intake and the upper limit. And that's where we're saying roughly we should aim for, for sodium. Okay, so we've talked about I wanted you to think about the hidden sources of sodium in the diet. Um, we know a lot of processed foods will have more sodium, right? So we talked about the frozen dinners, things like deli meat, canned goods. Um, I once had a lady say, oh, Samantha, I don't use this, the high sodium soup stock anymore. I use bouillon cubes. And I was like, oh, darn. Bouillon cubes are also high in sodium too. I had to let her down gently. Um, so we have to consider those things as well. Think of seasoned mixes. You know, the things that you might add to rice or to pasta or something like that. Um, soup stock can be notoriously high in sodium if you're not careful. But what you can do is you can look for guys like this um, where it's no salt added, right? Now, a lot of people say it doesn't taste like anything. Well, that's my friend where it's much easier to start with less sodium and you build the flavor up from there um, than to start with something higher sodium and take it away. <laughs> kind of hard to do, isn't it? So what we want to do, even the low sodium, so the, the low sodium in Canada is only 25% less sodium than the regular guy. So it's not a huge difference. It's only a quarter less. That's not enough of a difference for it to be low enough in sodium for you to use. Now, I'm also, I'm already gonna give you a high five for making your own soup, right? So when you make your own soup, you are in control of what's in it, right? So you can add the beans, you can add the lentils, you can add the, the veggies and all those kinds of wonderful things. Um, but if you start with a lower sodium or no added salt um, base, it's really easy to build on that. And so those are the keys to kind of do it. When you buy the pre-made soup, it's really hard to control that. Hey, I get it. Sometimes you don't have time. You just need something quick. That's fine. Because that's, it's a once in a blue moon. You're not doing that every day. If you're buying your soup every single day, 
Again, that may be more sodium than your body needs. And so that's why we want to talk about options, right? Other options. Okay, so we talk about, you know, higher sodium condiments. So things like barbecue sauce and pickles and, and ketchup and soy sauce and stuff like that. It doesn't mean you have to stop using them, but consider when you use a little bit of soy sauce in a wok, say you're making a big stir fry, that's feeding a larger group of people. So the amount of sodium you're getting from that soy sauce is probably relatively low. So not too big a deal, but we want to be mindful of restaurant eating. And this is where you, again, it's loss of control about how much you're consuming now. So when we consider fast food restaurants, fat level has changed a lot, right? You can get grilled things, you can get salads, you can get wraps and all these things. So you can get lower fat items, but we already know that's not the real issue but the sodium is pretty high consistently across a lot of them. There's even a salad you can get on an unnamed fast food restaurant that probably has the same amount of sodium in it than a medium French fries. I'm not telling you to go out and eat French fries, but you get the idea that it's not necessarily easy. Or even when you look at you know, things that are benign, like maybe um, a coffee shop muffin, right? Which might be considered, like muffins don't, seem unhealthy sometimes until you see they're big, right? They're really big. They end up having a lot of sugar or a lot of salt in it. Um, then you're not really getting what you were hoping to get from it. So things to consider definitely. Okay. The interesting thing about changing your intake of sodium in your diet is that your taste buds start changing. So when you start to eat lower sodium foods in the diet, you start maybe cooking at home a little bit more than ordering in, um, your body adjusts to that. And so you start, the less you use, the less you crave. It's interesting. It's, it, I'm not saying it's super easy the first, like if you go from you know, using full sodium stock to no salt added, you'll notice it. But over time, when you start ramping down your use of certain foods, your taste buds actually start to change. I had a gentleman come and see me and he had high blood pressure. So reducing a sodium intake was really significant for him. And so we knew that when we worked together, he was really vigilant about it. He was really motivated and started eating lower sodium. And he came back to me for a follow-up and he said, Samantha, you know, I went out to eat on the weekend with some friends and I almost couldn't eat my meal. It tasted so salty to me because he'd been so accustomed to eating lower sodium foods that it was really noticeable for him. Um, so those are the kinds of things we sometimes see is when you cook, try not to add salt to the water or maybe season it right at the end, right before you eat. So when you taste it right before you eat, just like all the chefs do and they tell you to taste your food right before you serve it, maybe that's a point where you might change the seasoning a bit more, right? But don't automatically, I think a lot of us default to salting things as we're cooking, as we're getting the water boiling, things like that. And maybe that you could be using different ways to season, like using herbs and spices. We even have like a sodium free um, little shaky herb thing that you can get and you can get, there's about 16 different varieties of this guy. Um, this is the Mrs. Dash, but there's loads out there um, that might have um, flavors that you like, and that might be something really great for you. Um, garlic and ginger, lemon and lime, fresh herbs. Um, if you grow your own fresh herbs, um, it can be a really wonderful way to add a punch of flavor. It just kind of sings in your mouth when you get that real freshness. So different ways to flavor your food can make you miss the salt less. And those kinds of things can make a difference. Okay, so let's talk about our final topic, and this is alcohol. Alcohol recommendations are important to talk about. Um, because we know alcohol in large amounts can have an impact on our blood pressure, right? So we want to consider um, how much we're consuming and things like that. We also know that in some cases, a larger intake of alcohol might increase certain blood fats called triglycerides. And so we want to be mindful of things like that. We also consider that um, alcoholic beverages are considered empty calories. And what that really means is, is that you can consume a lot, but you're not gaining any real nutrition from it. Now, everything we eat and drink does not have to be a source of nutrition, but certainly for people who consume a lot of alcohol and see their weight change, it's, it's probably there's a bit of a connection there. So if you don't drink alcoholic beverages, the current evidence is not so amazing and, and mind blowing that we suggest people start. 
So just to be very clear, if you don't drink alcohol because you don't like the taste or it's just not your thing, all the things I'm about to tell you about aren't here to help you change your mind and, and have you reconsider that. So um, there are lots of other health benefits that you can get from other aspects of your diet and it doesn't have to come from alcohol. So let's talk a little bit about what a drink is equivalent to, right? Because I talk to a lot of people like how many drinks a, a day or a week would, might you consume? But some people's idea of what amounts are look a little different. So for a beer, it's a typical bottle of beer. So that's about 12 ounces or about 340 mils. Okay. Um, imported beer is 10 ounces, just so you know, and tall boys are a lot more. I think they're about 13 ounces. Um, and same for cider, so like a hard cider, same amount, so that 12 ounce bottle size. For wine, it's about five ounces of wine, um, which is about 140 or so milliliters. Um, so it's the smaller wine that you would get at the restaurant. You know, they offer the six ounce, the nine ounce. It's closer to the six ounce, but still a little less than that at five. And then for um, spirits, it would be about an ounce and a half, which is about 43 or 40 milliliters, right? So it's about, about a shot and a half um, of spirits. So that would be like hard liquor, okay? So when we talk about drinks, that's what we're talking about in terms of equivalency. Um, when we talk about guidelines, it's different for men and women. So for women, it's about a drink a day, but no more than nine in a week. Um, for men, it's about uh, two drinks a day, but no more than 14 in a week. Um, the men get more um, alcohol than women, but they also get more fiber. So, <laughs> so you know, I think it works out. Um, here's the thing. So when it comes to alcohol intake, um, you can't sort of drink Thursday to Sunday and save up your Monday to Wednesday and roll them over. It doesn't work that way. Um, so you can't sort of save up your drinks and have a big party on Saturday night. Um, but certainly if you drink one or two drinks over the week or a day, um, that's sort of how it works. So if you have like a glass of wine with your dinner uh, most nights of the week, or you only drink on Friday and Saturday night, it's fine. You just can't have, we just don't recommend more than two or three drinks in a sitting. It could be a large amount. I know sometimes it happens where people might consume more than that. Um, when we, consume three or more drinks at a sitting it is considered a binge drink um, and you we lose any any small benefits that you do have would be lost so certainly the the scientific evidence that showed really um, modest improvements in um, in some of the blood components when people consume alcohol was more significant in people who drank one to two drinks a day. Um, but as soon as people drank three or more drinks a day, um, we didn't see those benefits anymore. And certainly at three drinks or more a day, we see potential safety issues as well. So um, certainly something to be mindful of. Um, I did say earlier that the tall boy can was 13 ounces. I'm wrong at 16 ounces. So, um, which is about, um, equivalent to 1.3 drinks. That's what I was thinking of. Despite the evidence, um, we don't encourage people to start drinking if you don't normally drink. So if you do have, um, you know, an occasional drink here and there, absolutely fine. Uh, it's not going to cause any harm unless your physician, your cardiologist told you otherwise to avoid anything, or if you have any issues with medications you're taking. But certainly if you have a modest amount of alcohol intake over the week, there is a, a modest amount of evidence to say that there are some some minor improvements. Sometimes we'll see an increase in good cholesterol called HDL cholesterol. Um, and sometimes we see um, it has a mild blood thinning effect in some cases. So that's where we see some of the, the benefits. Um, some people believe that red wine is more um, beneficial than white wine. I had a, a woman come and see me. She says, Samantha, I can't drink red wine. It gives me a headache. And I go, try white <laughs> or even better, rosé. <laughs> um, and she was pretty happy about that. So we know that red wine does have some additional um, tannins and they have other antioxidant properties. There's an antioxidant in it called resveratrol. Resveratrol has been shown to be a very potent antioxidant. But in all the studies they did, um, they didn't really show any improvements in health outcomes. So it didn't change heart disease risk. It didn't make people live longer or anything like that. But it certainly has been shown to maybe improve a few blood markers, but nothing super um, earth shattering there. Um, so evidence favoring one type of alcohol over another is still pretty questionable and mixed. Um, so it's pretty, and in, it, the evidence is inconsistent in that we don't say 
only have this, not have this. Yeah, if you prefer white wine or red wine or a beer or something like that, absolutely fine. The only time I would say be mindful is if you're having a mixed drink. So if you have something like a rum and cola and you have diabetes, you might be mindful of the type of cola you use and the sugar content of that cola. Uh, or even if you don't have diabetes, you might still want to be mindful of the sugar intake of the mixers that you're adding to your, your liquor. So bottom line, don't overdo it. Uh, enjoy in moderation. If you do drink alcohol, if you don't drink alcohol, there's loads of other stuff you can do. So you don't worry about the alcohol part of it. Thanks everyone for joining me today for the presentation, what to eat for your healthy heart. I know you got some takeaways from today's presentation. So pick out stuff that really works for you and remember about the balance, remember about enjoying your food. And thanks so much for joining me today.